Yeah, I wasn't going to put this on the podcast, but I just had to, I had to know because because Don was like, he was, he was a really bad dude. He was really drunk. He says he was doing the bongos on something. Not Don. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's what happened. Now, Dusty Road uh, always fancied himself as a uh, rock and roll star, as several of these guys do nowadays. And, you know, Chris Jericho starting. I mean, not a new deal. Dusty Road was doing it back in the 70s. So, I always tell everybody, everybody, well, I invented this or I started this. In the pro wrestling business, I don't think there's not a new thing that anybody, if anybody ever invents something new, I've been around for 60 years, I would know about it, you know, and uh, that's it. But uh, 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 so Dusty fancied himself, you know, he, we, we, I, uh, Dusty was one of my best friends. I mean, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, we, we piled around together, traveled together and, and, and Florida in those days, I mean, was run by Eddie Graham and it was run with one of these iron fists. I mean, kayfabe was the most important thing that, that, that you could have for those who don't know kayfabe is just keeping the secrets of the wrestling business to yourself and, uh, the good guys and the bad guys, we all had this honky tonk, a honky tonk being an old country bar. Here in Tampa, everybody used to frequent after after the matches. So it was really strange. On one side of the bar would be the bad guys. On the other side of the bar, and it was a it was a big ass bar, one of those old, old roadhouse type that had the big floor out and you know big dance floor out in the middle. So you know it had plenty of space, and it was it was lit where you know if you sat in certain places, you, you know nobody could see you. Guys used to go there, so. Uh, the guy that, of course, that, that, uh, was the house man there, Captain Lewis was his name, uh, would, uh, I, uh, you know, he, he, he befriended Dusty and all a bunch of the other wrestlers. So, uh, you know, Dusty, he, he Dusty liked to sing. He thought he was a singer. Uh, he had one song, Johnny be good. I mean, how hard <laughs> is it to sing Johnny be good? <laughs> Johnny be good tonight, tonight, Johnny be good. And of course, the house band would play loud enough to drown his voice out, you know, and just to digress a little bit, one time being dust and my brother, we went to a Willie Nelson concert over in another little lake in Lakeland, Florida here outside of Tampa. And, uh, and Dusty was hotter and a hotter and a pepper, you know? So, uh, so Willie, Willie invited Dusty to come up, but you had this one song a circle be unbroken or something like that. Uh, that a lot of people would get invited up on the stage. So he asked Dusty one night to come up. And so Dusty, of course, got right next to Willie and Willie usually didn't have that. He usually had the guests, you know, on a different microphone, but of course, Dusty being Dusty Rhodes, <laughs> I'm getting right next to Willie Nelson. And of course, Dusty's screaming the lyrics. He's not singing them. I mean, he's screaming them. Well, yeah, they all come off stage after the, after the set and Dusty looks over at Briscoe. He said, I thought you said this guy could sing. He's the ho most horrible singer I've ever heard. Of. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't phase the dream at all. You know, dream had the confidence. So Dusty, uh, Dusty was getting hotter and hotter and could be. So, you know, we started going to a lot of concerts and, you know, getting the same reaction. One day, one night, we were coming back from one. Dusty said, you know what? I'm going to rent the army and I'm going I'm to have Captain Lewis, you know, Bull Roper band was, was at, at the honky tonk to house band. I'm gonna have them back me up and I'm gonna rehearse these songs with, uh, with Captain Lewis. And we're going to put on a concert at the army where they had the, they had the wrestling matches at, and, you know, everybody, well, go. a little bit of money at the time. So it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't a huge. And Eddie, of course, got him a deal on the army, you know, where he didn't have to pay much rent. But he made the mistake of inviting the entire roster. And in the back, like in most big venues, only there's dressing rooms, you know. And of course, Dusty caters the damn thing, and then but mostly he caters it with tequila and, and whiskey and, and and alcohol. So of course it's a it's a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, whatever it was, it doesn't matter. But you know, it was a day for drinking. And so we're all backstage and we're we're all we're all getting 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 wasted and everything. So the, the preliminary act, of course, they, they, they go through their sets and now it's come time for Captain Lewis, Bull Roper band and guest star featuring the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, you know, and everybody goes crazy. 
everybody been, I mean, Dusty had planned. I mean, I've done the, I've known Dusty a long, a lot of times and I've seen him where he should have had his feelings hurt a lot more, but you know, he was <laughs> expecting like six, 7,000 people to sell that damn place out. We had six, 60 or 70 people in the <laughs> day of venue, but being American dream, that's not going to bother me. I'm going to go on and get them to show like there's 6,000 people out there. So that's, he's on stage and he goes through a couple of songs and, you know, everybody's and by that time, everybody's pretty well wasted and, you know, had to, had to, had to fill an alcohol. Mind you, Don Morocco was, was one of the hottest talents that we had in the business down here in Florida. The guy, guy could do anything, you know, a big, big guy, but he was the most athletic guy. I mean, that you ever seen for somebody that size. So he, we had a great program all laid out for Dusty and, and Don Morocco. Well, Mr. Barnett, Jim Barnett, who ran, owned and ran Atlanta, had been coming down watching the American Dream. Of course, he ran Atlanta on Friday nights down. I mean, where you put 16, 70,000 people in there. So the plan was really to have Morocco. This is kind of a test program to see if Don could really get over that strong because he kind of knew, you know, and so. Uh, and so Eddie said, yeah, I'll run the program down here first, and then you could take it to Atlanta. So there were there was always plans for Don to to come and go, get over here, then move up to to Atlanta, you know, where he could be on the global TV and and um, national TV and and be in the big omnis and, and the big buildings and still make the Florida big shows. So so here, and like I said, uh, as I said before, Cape Fabe was really, really tight and really important to Eddie Graham. So the concert's going, we're all wasted. It's a Sunday afternoon. And back in those days, believe it or not, we didn't have Sunday shows, you know, it's that started a little bit later. So you had Sunday was kind of a day off where the guys could get together, you know, the good guys to party and the bad guys to party. Well, Don had been my my partner, my friend for, you know, a couple of years through Georgia and a couple other places. So we kind of, you know, stayed backstage until it's time dusty out. And, you know, we, we started filling the music and doc captain Lewis was, was really a good backup man. So he, he, he played pretty damn good music. So we're getting in the spirit of things, you know, along with the spirit of, of, of Jose Cuervo and then, uh, <laughs> started to drink a little bit. Now, Morocco can handle beer and he can handle uh, Carvassier, or what I think that was his favorite drink, the brandy. That was his favorite drink. But when it came to tequila, he would, he's like, I'm Native American. He's like an Indian. He'd turn into a wild, wild damn Hawaiian. <laughs> 300 pounds, it's hard to stop. You know? So the more we drank, the crazier Don got. And uh, <laughs> my wife loved Don Morocco. Death. It was probably my wife's probably favorite wrestler next to Roddy. Roddy Piper and Don Morocco were my wife's. Uh, their families were my wife too bad. Cause that, that kind of shows you what kind of friend I hung out with. <laughs> <laughs> Piper, Piper, if I could just claim Piper and Morocco, two of my best friends, you know, I, I was doing some shit I shouldn't have been doing back then. <laughs> Under don't the bad don't influence. tell me they led you astray, Jerry. Don't no, tell me they led you twist, astray. They twisted my arm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to the concert. So it comes time. And, and you know, it's kind of funny. The, hill, the bad guys are standing on one side of the stage. And here, here we're standing. The baby faces are on the other side of the stage. And Dusty's in the middle up there on the stage. And, and Eddie Graham standing off over in the shadows. They're kind of eyeballing this all out. So, you know, as, as the concert gets going, Dusty kind of, you know, invites, you know, baby faces up one by one. Bugsy McGraw goes up. Mike Graham, Steve Kern go up. The Briscoe brothers go up. We're up there singing. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I said, uh-oh. I see a big 300 pound Hawaiian dancing his way onto the stage, <laughs> holding a bottle of tequila. And then, like I said, Eddie, Eddie was a strict ass promoter. There's a lot of things you do. Eddie was the one that corn phrase guys. It's all right for you to get in fight here in Tampa, but if you lose, don't bother to come to work. They say, just get in your car and get on out of town. Cause I don't want you around here. If you want to fight when, you know, and, but stay away from each other. 
So here comes Donald. We'd all been in back, mind you, all drinking together, you know. So we we hadn't broken up that that portion of the party yet. <laughs> so you know, we're all rolling, we're all feeling good. And all of a sudden, like I said, out of the corner of my eye, I see this big uh Big of white. He's not hula dancing, thank God. And he don't have a grass skirt on. You know, he got the Florida shorts on and Florida t-shirt and the flip-flops on. He comes down, he grabs a microphone, and he starts screaming hard, uh, singing Johnny Be Good or whatever the damn song was. And and we're going and finally works his way over to American Dream, who he just had a big TV angle with, and just getting ready to go around and sell out the entire territory for months and months on end and when 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 florida was on fire man you made some serious jack you made some serious serious dinero there so so we're all looking forward to this program because we knew don could 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 get the job done with, with the dream and so we're all excited for don and because he was don was a great guy and, and a great friend <laughs> and so he finally works his way over, kind of elbows me and my brother out of the way and puts his arm around Dusty, starts humming, hugging Dusty as they're singing, John to be good. Well, one of the promote or one of the one of the local uh, policemen who is a security for Tuesday night wrestling and and one of Eddie's kind of bodyguards for the guys to make sure where they didn't ever get in trouble. He looks up at Eddie on the old way and he said, Man, that Morocco's really gone. And Eddie looks at him and said, you're right. He is. So two days later, we have tap of the army. I mean, Don don't hear anything. And he's calling me. He said, did I screw up? Yeah, did I screw up? Oh, I hadn't heard anything. Cause Eddie pissed off at me and my brother too, for getting Don a little wasted you know, <laughs> during the pre-show. But it wasn't our year. I mean, what are you going to do? 300 pound uh, man that wants to drink tequila. You he's know? a thirsty man. He's a thirsty man. Yeah. He's a big man. And he's a big man, you're right. And he, and you're not going to tell him no. And he's wanting to drink, so you're drinking with him. When he said, "Hey, have a shot with him," so well, like I said, we kill off two or three bottles. So that, uh, uh, the cop kind of well, well it looks like Morocco gone. And so, uh, and on the meantime, on Monday, Jim Barnett had called Eddie Graham, and somebody had gotten hurt in Georgia, so they needed Morocco up there a little bit sooner than what was anticipated. So. Uh, Eddie told, uh, told Jim that, yeah, give me, give me a, uh, a week out, uh, out of, and I'll send him up there. So that, that, I don't think, uh, Don was actually fired as far as he was just transferred to another territory, uh -huh. but the story is a hell of a lot better. You don't know, getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> so I that's kind of a gist of it, you know, and, um, of course, Don goes to Morocco, uh, goes to Atlanta. Sets a place on fire with Dusty and Rassing too, and all that stuff. Then he gets the call to go up north, you know. And back in those days, you know, going up north to New York was was the place you uh, you want to be. And Don was the right size to go up there. And the athlete, I mean, I don't think it ever had an athlete uh, as great as Don Morocco was go up there. But uh, that's kind of the story. And you know, it wasn't. You know, we like to tell the story. Morocco got fired that night. Well, it wasn't that night. It was two or three nights later, and it was like <laughs> two weeks later before he left the territory. But he got a couple of weeks out of dream here, but he got the bigger run in landing the Omni in front of 16, 17,000 people instead of five or 6,000 people. So it worked out for the best for, for everybody. <laughs> there we go. I'll tell you what, you know, that's so that's such a better introduction that I was going to do on this show. But I'll just... I'll just turn around and do the count. It's Gerald Briscoe, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've got Jerry on here with us. <laughs> that was a far better intro than I could have ever done, so we'll just carry on straight from there. Listen, um, I've got so many questions to ask you. Uh, is it Gerald or Jerry do you prefer? Uh, Gerald, uh, my given name, I usually go by Gerald. Okay, Gerald. Um, before uh, before we sort of kick off with like the main main bit of the interview, I've got a million questions. We're not going to get through them all. I know this. Um, I was hoping you could regale me with a couple of tales about uh, Black Jack Lanza, who passed away a few days ago. And um, you know, as far as I can tell, really well liked, big rugged veteran of many many decades. Everybody loved him as an agent. But uh, any personal stories from you? Yeah, I first met Black Jack in in St. Louis, Missouri. I mean that. 
Blackjack was a staple. Jack by uh, uh, Lanza was was kind of these one of these individual guys. He him when him and uh, the other Blackjack uh, Mulligan team, but man, they were intimidating folks. But at this time, he was wrestling singles in St. Louis, and uh, believe it or not, Jack was kind of a mid card guy. He was one of those guys that uh, St. Louis, as you know, was, was the mecca of the NWA, the headquarters of the NWA, and it's where Sam brought brought the champion in, and then you'd build the champion. But he had a group of guys kind of like Roger Kirby and some of these guys, Blackjack Lands was one of them, that when the champion came in, was you ready to 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 go up, he would he would work with the champion, make sure the champion looked great, you know, the week before he was having his big title match or something. My brother was NWA world champion at the time. And when he'd look at the card, I mean, when he'd know ahead of time, of course, because he was champion, but when he'd look at the schedule and the see, he always got a smile on his face because here's his land. I mean, a six foot nine, six foot eight, whatever he was, 300 plus pound. And then back in those days, land was huge and muscular. And, and man, what an athlete he was, too. He could go. My brother loved being in the ring with him. Jack, Jack, even in his book, I stated that Jack Lanza was probably the best guy that he ever worked with, you know, as far as being a pure athlete. And that's a hell of a compliment because Jack worked with every, all, all the best guys in the business during, during that era. They were not golden era, too, I should say. So, um, but Jack, uh, I would work the tag team with Black Jack and his partner, and I've worked a few, uh, End of it. So we got to know each other, and uh, you know, he owned. Uh, he he worked his way in. Very very bright man. Jack Lanza was college graduate, school teacher, and all that stuff. Very bright man, and uh, what a nice guy. But he had worked his way into ownership of of part of uh, Vern Gagne's uh, uh, little territory, AWA up there, and he, he purchased Winnipeg and was running Winnipeg. Winnipeg was a a dead ass town that you didn't want to go to because you knew you weren't going to make anybody. Hmm. Well, Blackjack took this town over, and all of a sudden, the guys are wanting to go there. Number one, because Blackjack was such a good guy, you know, that you wanted to help him out. And number two, he was busting his butt doing the promotional work. And all of a sudden, Winnipeg started drawing bigger than some of these others. So, you know, all the guys were coming to, uh, to Jack Lanza saying, hey, book, book me in Winnipeg, book me in Winnipeg. So he turned that Winnipeg into a losing town into one of the most profitable towns in, in Vern Gagne's uh, stable, uh, stable of, uh, of venues. And so uh, I never worked that territory, uh, but uh, – a few years later, when uh, Junior Vince Junior started making his move around, he started making you know individual uh, deals with 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 people that own pretty good cities and territories and everything. Of course, Winnipeg was kind of separate from what Vern Vern was going to sell because of his ego. I could do this, but Blackjack saw the writing on the wall, saw the vehicle, and saw what my brother and I had done down in Georgia by giving Vince the uh, selling Vince the uh, the rights to Georgia Championship Wrestling, and so. He kind of saw the writing on the wall that hey, you know, I'm gonna I better hitch my horse to to the winner. So of course he he, he saddled up with Vince Jr. and uh, and uh, so he got a job backstage, kind of doing the road agent uh, job for Vince. And so I was I was uh, move myself move myself up the ladder with Vince, and or I was I was over the agents. I was ahead. I would assign the agency. Uh, the, the venues that they were, that they were assigned to all over the world and, uh, and communicate with them, uh, through Vance venture call me early that, uh, that morning. And then I would get with the road agent and, and we would lay out the card the way, the way Vince saw it and the way Vince wanted it. And there were very few guys agent being an agent that time that Vince trusted 100%. So when we get to the, uh, to the venues where Jack Landa was from. He, who's your agent there, Briscoe? I said, Jack Landa. He's good. He said, we don't have to go over a lot of stuff because I trust Jack enough. 
But you go where there's another agent, he would go over every little minute detail that there was in, in a, in a five-minute match. I mean, the guy is thorough. That's where a lot of people don't give Vince McMahon credit. He's a detail guy. I mean, every little detail has got to be perfect in his mind before, before it's presented to the talent. But with Landa, you know, you could kind of just give him a, a, a summary and a brief outline of what 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 uh, what the boss wanted, and he would fill in all the blanks, and it was usually the right right uh, right moods to fill in the blank with. So he was trusted. The guys are very quick on they they catch on who who you can work and who you can't work, and who you want to work and who you don't work. Well, Lanza being the big, imposing, intimidating guy that he was, nobody was wanting to mess around with Lanza. Plus, Jack had worked so hard to get in that position. Everybody wanted to help Jack. So it was a real cooperative effort. So when you went to Jack's town, you saw you didn't see any of this little click thing. These guys over in this corner, these guys over in this corner, they're conspiring on how they can get their cell over. You would find a group effort on, hey, how can we help land to get this talent even bigger one? Everybody respected Jack Landa. Landa had one rule. You treat him like you want to be treated. You show up to work on time and you do your job. And then what you do after hours is, 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 is on you. You know, uh, I'm not going to babysit to your grown man. Well, the talent grew to respect Jack like that, and Jack liked to sip on an adult beverage after after the event was over. So he would, where most of the agents would go to the room and you know call Vance and stewed off the guys and stuff like that. Guys knew that Jack Landa wasn't a stooge, and if Jack Landa told you something, ninety nine and nine tenths of the time, whatever he told you was going to become true. So he was able to gain the trust factor with, with the talent. And I think that was the most important asset that, that, that Jack Landa had, that he was just one of these guys that, that, you know, you liked, you liked, and you didn't want to see fail. So everybody worked with him. Did, um, did you have any examples or have any examples to give about a couple of wrestlers who go out for a match and then do things specifically to annoy Jack just to get a reaction out of him. Because I've heard of several stories of uh, he would have some of the best reactions when uh, a match would go wrong on purpose and he'd just be there gobsmacked. Yeah, Jack had a little thing, uh, that, you know, he would do if something would go wrong. And, you know, I, I mean, he was so, so respected, but, you know, everyone's with guys are going to be guys. They're, they're going to play around a little bit. And uh, Jack was, like I said, was a serious man there. And, uh, I mean, I've come right down to Pacifics. I, I'm not going to tell all the details, but uh, Stone Cold was a perfect example. Sometimes Stone Cold would go out and go off script because he was Stone Cold, and Stone Cold and 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 Jack Landa had a had a, a bond like this. I mean, they were they were tight, and and for the guys, I mean, he would always take the guy that screwed up and they go into the shower, you know. That's where you had all your conference meetings. You go into the shower, and he and he would they would they would sort it out, but it would never get back to Vance unless it was a real fragrant uh, violation that Jack had to report it with. The guys kind of knew that, so uh, so Stone Cold and him they they built this bond together, and Stone Cold usually requested Landa to be his agent at ever ever match. Jack kind of had it made because Stone Cold was our top baby at the time, drawing the top houses. So everywhere that Stone Cold went, I'd, I'd book Landa there with him to Landa to make a payoff there. But uh, but um, I think him him and Stone Cold one time went went in the locker room and and just for the sake of the boys, go when you when you when you went to that shower with Landa, everybody kind of you know have 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 that ear out what. So they started hollering at each other, just working each other, you know, just playing with each other. Nothing serious. They'd come out and, well, all right, you do it one more time, I'm gonna have to call a boss. Well, Landy, you're nothing but a stew. You know what I mean? It, they, they, it was just all, all in fun, but uh, it, it, it was, it was a great time. And then uh, the funny, funny story I had, I have on Jack Land. Jack Landa was like a damn chimney with those damn Marlboro <laughs> cigarettes. He called him the Marlboro man. Man, he only smoked on the road. 
I would, I would, I'd get, get be on be in a car with him. We'd stop and leave in a town. He'd get three packs of Marlboro. Jack, what are you going to do? Well, I got to, and I, and I get towards the end and he's lighting one up. He'd, he'd have one and he'd, I said, Jack, what do you, he said, I'm not going to, Jack was a cheap SOB too. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to throw these away. And if I say, well, may I, I said, what do you mean throw them away? He said, my wife don't know I smoke. <laughs> Is that you or me? Oh, that's me there. No, that's I, you. Sorry about that. Uh, my son, Wes. Uh, can I call you later? There you go. And so I'm going to put this down on the floor so it don't buzz on me. So um, where was it? So, um, so uh, we're smoking. So he would, he would smoke up the three packs where he had two hours or an hour. Uh, he would make sure he smoked every one of the cigarettes. He didn't want his wife to find a package or a stray cigarette. So I started messing with him. Yeah, we all carried these briefcase Halliburton. Jack carried this big silver Halliburton. Sometimes he would leave it open and just out of spite, a cigarette package would be laying beside the, the beside the halberd. I'd slip a cigarette out and slide it in one of those back pockets. Of course, when he got <laughs> home, his wife would refresh his, his bag and everything. You know? And plus, I, I used to ask him, Jack, I said, I'm no offense, but you know, after three days on the road with you, and he had he always wanted to look, he never changed shirts. You know, he changed pants and underwear and socks, I hope, but his shirt was always that, 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 that plum colored shirt. He had it ever. I said, that's the only shirt you got? Well, no, I got three. They're all the same color. Yeah, so it's like Bart Simpson. Yeah, as, a, exactly. as a wardrobe of exactly the same t-shirts. Very good. <laughs> exactly. So, And man... And I love Jack to death, but him and Pat Patterson, they would go out back and they'd smoke a pack of cigarettes before they'd finish a conversation. Cause Pat was a smoker, just like the land. And they had the man, Bruce Pritchard used to, we used to hate to have to get in a small meeting with them in a small room because both of them smelt like, and just reeked a cigarette smoke. And there's nothing like, you know, a day old cigarette smell, especially coming out of your mouth. And we used to get both of you, you guys, you guys were meant for each other. You guys ride together. You guys be because you both of your breath stink. So I asked, I, I, um, one day, like I said, I stuck that cigarette into a pouch in, in, in the back of Jack briefcase. So the next, next day he's off, he's home and his wife's going through the briefcase, straightening out all of this, you know, you just throw your notes in you when you're on the road, you just throw your notes in there. And his wife was, well, school teacher do also. And so she would straighten everything out and have everything organized. And so she has, she straightened everything out. All of a sudden she picks up. And I used to ask Jack, what do you do with your clothes when you get home? He said, the first thing I do, I go to my, my bedroom. I take off all my road clothes on and I go right to the washer and dryer and dump them all in the washer and dryer. But he didn't even have his wife wash his clothes because <laughs> he afraid she'd smell it. So all of a sudden she's going through that briefcase. She pulls out a cigarette in the back of it. All right, Jack, I've been suspecting this. I've been smelling stuff, but I've never, what, what should, well, you know, Dan Briscoe probably playing a joke on me. And he was right, it was Briscoe. And I got a phone call. And he, he, you SOB, why in the hell did I, I got all kinds of grief. What do you get grief for? And I'm, you know, I'm playing a dumb, dumb, dumb guy. And he said, you put that cigarette. No, I didn't put no cigarette. Call him on. So I finally admitted to him. He had his wife call me and to back up his story because she didn't believe that I put it in there either. So he had his wife call me and she said, did you put that cigarette in the back of Jack's um, briefcase? I said, what cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> and now they're back and forth. For so finally I said, yes, I put it in, in there. So the next weekend on the, on the tour, I run into him, boy, he mattered a hornet at me. He starts cutting me out. And then all the guys, we're all laughing like crazy. You know, that Jack got caught smoking the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, mate, she could have guessed. I mean, like his voice is probably four octaves lower over all the chain smoking over the years. And must have, she must have been able to guess, but I, I'm, I'm actually going to move on now. I'm going to give you. Uh, a bit of a game. It's like a, a name association, word association game. So I'm going to um, give you some rapid fire sentences and you tell me who best fits the sentence or description that I give you. And uh, the first one is the funniest person in the locker room. Any locker room. Any locker room. 
Bugsy McGraw. Really? Yeah, Bugsy was hilarious. Bugsy and Bugsy looked apart too. I mean, he wasn't called Bugsy because it's Bugsy. But he, was called, <laughs> he, he looked was funny. he looked funny as well as was funny. And he stuttered, and it's it bad to make make fun of somebody with a speech impediment. But he wouldn't stutter unless he got excited. And he he was a Big Ten football. He played at Purdue University. Played American football at Purdue University, which is a big, 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 big time school and a big conference, Big Ten conference. So, and I'm I'm a Big A guy. My brother and I were Big A Oklahoma State guys, and so we we're Big A down Big Twelve guys, uh, but Big Eight at that time. So we we get Bugsy going. Bugsy we carrying on a normal conversation without you know stuttering his words or anything. We'd start bringing up football, and then we'd just just get to the point where we'd get Bud get so frustrated that that he couldn't say another word. And he'd just pretty soon he'd just throw his stuff down, and walk out of hell with you guys. I'm leaving the damn dressing room, not coming back till you guys are out of the dressing room. But we just Bugsy was one of the, he he was hilarious, and he always had really funny stories that really made sense, but at the same time just entertained the hell out of you. Uh, this one is going to be very hard to answer. The last man standing at the bar. Yeah, I have to repeat that. Dear oh, I'm that. sorry. Uh, the last man standing at the bar. Andre the Giant. <laughs> and after Andre, American Dream could 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 put down some alcohol too. And. Uh, yeah. Those well, big guys, I mean, those big guys, I mean, you know, got my, I was 210, 15 pounder, you know, and I'm two, I'm standing there drinking with these guys, 285 plus, you know, we had some serious ass drinker. Manny Fernandes was another one. I wasn't a big, huge giant guy, but Manny, Manny could put down some alcohol and yeah, Manny, my only trouble with Manny put down that alcohol, he would get a little, a little feisty, you know, want to, want to. Want to test his manlyhood out, so, uh, but Andre and and the big Joe LaDuke, I mean, what a drinker he was, and sometimes we'd uh, we'd we'd like to slip in, you know, the moonshine that they have here in the in the South, and you know, tell the guys it's vodka, you know, and here it is, one hundred and seventy five proof of <laughs> pure grade, you know, and. And here, have some, have some of our vodka, you know, and pour some of that moonshine in there instead, you know, and they get crazy. I mean, it was, it was fun. My brother and I, we, we both lived out in the county. My brother had a, a big place over not too far from where I live right now on a big lake. And he'd, he'd had the hell that he only you know, had pretty well known here and all these kids around, around the lake there, they'd, they'd go fishing with him and they'd catch, you know, a couple of hundred little catfish and jack every once in a while to have a big fish fry and have everybody over we had uh, some of your guys there and uh, who in the hell was it? i think it's scotty mcgee and <laughs> damn i can't remember one other guy but anyway you know we're there and we we popped the moonshine open and so we're here drink this you know, oh this american uh liquor you know it's nothing you know and i gotta get an eye so all from one of our Redneck hillbilly friends comes over with a mason jar of moonshine here and have that have that English guy drink some of this. So before long, I mean, we're in Florida, mine in the summertime, it's hot. And so this guy gets so drunk that we're out at all out in the lake swimming. All of a sudden we look over by the dock. He had fallen off the dock and he was face first in the water. Hell, we got a casualty here, maybe. So we pulled him out of the water, Scotty, and we start, you know, Scotty slapping him around instead of giving him compression and all that stuff, you know, because he didn't know any better back in those days. And slapping him around, we saw that he was mentally awake. So we get one of those uh, chase chairs, you know, that you can lay down on. We're, we don't lay him on his back. We're smarter than that. So we uh, we lay him over on his stomach. We set him over out of the way beside the dock there so everybody's partying everybody forgets about old scott you know all of a sudden it's starting to get dark now when it gets dark here in florida and there's no breeze or anything on those hot summer nights mosquitoes come out and those mosquitoes are big enough they start carrying you away so 
all of a sudden we start taking a a, a, a body count. Where's Scotty? Well, last time we saw him, he was face down in the damn lake. <laughs> Somebody check on him. So they go over and Scotty is like, they still hadn't moved a month. He's face down on that damn uh, chase chair. And they go to get him and he, he, he wakes up real sudden. He's, you know, he, damn, where have I been? You know, what's going on? And all of a sudden he starts slapping and we get Scotty up. Now it's in the dark. We go bring him over by the light. His, his entire body had, he must've been bitten by probably a thousand mosquitoes and he's just got whelps all over him. Turned to find out he's allergic to this. <laughs> So he's off for work until any gram gets mad or in hell at us for throwing these damn parties. But sometimes these parties would end up with, you know, we didn't even know who was there. I mean, four or 500 people show up. More people showed up at our party than Dusty Road Rock. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't charge. Dusty was charged. But yeah, Scotty McGee, he he was a wild one. Hmm. And uh, he wasn't feeling any pain, at least, at least for a brief period after uh, when least, he woke up. At least until six hours, the next two or three days, he felt a lot of pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the next one now. Uh, the first time you saw Ric Flair naked in a bar or hotel. Ooh. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the first time. Uh, Rick. <laughs> Rick started right right after I left North Carolina, but I kept going back into North Carolina. So I was, I was part of Rick's first first breakout and breakthrough and all that stuff. But uh, it was a bar in Charlotte, North Carolina. I forgot the name of it. Where I, I, everybody used to go. I saw Wahoo leaning up against the wall one time, and he took a shot of whiskey. The next thing I know, Wahoo's like one of those giant sequoia trees just fall face first. Right, right down on it. <laughs> I think it's a space odyssey or something like that. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Wah Wahoo was the guy. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll move on. Uh, the wrestler that you faced that was least likely to visit the laundry and wash his gear. Ooh. <laughs> we always hated that, especially in Florida. You know, a lot of guys get in the habit, you know, uh, to coming back. And like I said, it's hot and humid here in the state of Florida in the summertime. And, uh, you know, a lot of those buildings back in the 70s I'm going to didn't have air conditioning at the time. Sort of like the UK or slow getting the air conditioning in, uh, in the public building. So not only would you have the, have a packed house and you know 110 degrees and humid humidity inside that ring but back in those days if you recall smoking was legal in public places so of course you you go to a sporting event what 99% of the people in there they're males and they're 99% of them are going to smoke and if they don't they want to impress a friend so they'll just light up a cigarette anyway so not only are you working your butt off in this heat and humidity, but you're inhaling all that damn smoke and everything. So, um, so that that was one of my one of my least favorite things. What was your question again? Uh, the uh, the uh, wrestler who was didn't visit the laundry as often as they should have done. Oh, so uh, so anyway, after the event, a lot of these guys would come in and just throw their gear in in their bag and throw it in the back of their trunk and they get home two, three o'clock in the morning. They just want to hit, hit the bed. So they leave that damn bag in the trunk of their car. So overnight that, that stench is fumigating. So now it's smoke, sweat, and, and all the other elements. And they, well, you know, they grab a fresh towel. Hell, I'll just do it. And you could always tell those guys, they'd come to a locker room, they'd sit down, if they'd sit down next to you, they open that bag, and man, that stench would just roll out of that bag. And you'd notice the guys who did it because there'd be empty spaces on both <laughs> sides of them, nobody getting clear, and everybody would come and kind of set, you know, a can of uh, air refresher or, 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 you know, some brood or whatever the, the style of clone was back in those days, and here you might need this and they put those damn clothes on you go out and, have, and i and i and, and i'm notorious for having a weak stomach 
There was one guy you want to know was one guy, and I'm on. I'm, uh, I don't think he's around anymore. I heard that he's a big guy and beat the crap. But there were several of them. He wasn't the only one, but he he was the biggest. Siegfried Stinky, what you call him, Ziggy Stinky. Right. That was his name. Ziggy it said Siegfried Stinky. He was Ziggy Stinky. Because man, he stunk. He stunk worse than any cesspool you know, that I've ever been around. I, I rib Robbie Brookside, you know, Liverpool. Well, you got, you got that Blackpool, Liverpool and cesspool. You know, there ain't <laughs> no cesspool over here. That's the United States, you know, but that's me and Robbie ribbing each other. I think I live near cesspool. Uh, <laughs> I'm not too far away from it. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, stinky was, was probably the worst, but there were several offenders and there's no excuse for it, but it was just being lazy and, but stinky just had a habit of it. And it wasn't only in Florida that, that, that went around with him everywhere. And guys, after a while, I mean, you know, you'd finally get to the point where you couldn't, you'd, you'd hate for those guys to get it. The bigger guys, of course, had the bigger issues because they sweat more, you know, big old Leon white, you know, Vader, Vader, Vader had that issue with, with several people with people. Sometimes people just refused, but we didn't have that option back in our day. You work with who you're booked with, but you know, as time as the business grew, the guy got more powerful. You didn't want to work with somebody. You go to the boss, tell them why you didn't want to work with them. And on the money, most of the time you got your, your, your way. With, uh, with that said, I'll ask a couple more, then we'll move on. Uh, the biggest ribber that you ever met. Mr. Fuji, without a doubt. <laughs> Fuji, Fuji was, was, was hilarious. And Fuji was one of these guys that you just couldn't help, but love. I mean, he was, you know, friendly, he was, he was talkative, he was funny as hell. And he always had a funny story, but you better watch Fuji when he started getting close to you. And, and I'll just tell you a quick, funny story. If I have time and uh, absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll try to keep it as clean as clean as a family as I can. You don't have to, don't worry. So uh, we're, I'm in Australia and I'm a kid in Australia and I, and I just basically gotten out of college and I got, got a trip to Australia. Well, and in that, in that crew in Australia was King Curtis, Mark Lewin, and Mr. Foodie hadn't arrived with me. King Curtis and Mark Lewin at the time. I mean, they were, you know, it was the sixties. What can I say? You so, uh, you know, drugs were, were drugs <laughs> at that time and drugs were drugs at the that you smoked and you were felt safe doing them. So, uh, I had never, I was an athlete and I swear to God, I'd never smoked a, a, a marijuana cigarette in my life until I got to Australia, you know, after, after, after I was out of college. And so down there, I, I, I made friends with, with these guys for some reason. You know, <clears throat> I, I got to be really good friends with them. Well, they wanted to take it a step farther than, than just the smoke. So Fuji was still in Hawaii. Well, they had what they called the magic cookie. And I'm sure Don Morocco mentioned the magic cookie. He's never mentioned it to me. I'll, I'll bring it up to him though. Next time I speak to him. Well, they had a cookie around and Don probably reason Don don't want to say he was guilty of this, but <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. It sounds like I've been hitting it too. <laughs> so. So they devised a fan plan. They went and went to Jim Barnett and said, Hey Jim, bring Fuji in. We'll pay his transportation in. If you'll just pay him, give him six weeks down here and work. And, um, and so, but what they concocted was Fuji was going to go by Singapore and, uh, and grab one of these cookies and bring it into Australia. And these cookies were like, you got Hershey candy bars over there, you know, the big Hershey. Yeah, I know they are. Yeah. Yeah. Where's. This damn cookie looked like a gigantic Hershey bar. And so Mark, and now you got Mark Lewin and you got King Curtis and you got Mr. Fuji. Those three, some man, they can go through some uh, illegal drugs quick. <laughs> you know? And so they didn't trust each other holding the drug. And they knew I was, I, believe it or not, I was a straight kid back in those days. I was scared to death to do anything. Afraid I'd get deported and sent back home. So I was, I was minding my P's and Q's down there. So, 
So Lewis and, and Cur, uh, Curtis come up with the idea of taking the cookie away from uh, Fuji because this big Hershey bar kept getting smaller and smaller. And on Friday night, on, on Friday, I believe we had Sydney. Then the next day, we go all the way out to Western Australia. And that, that's farther than going from Tampa, the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast of the United States, from New York to, uh, to L.A. It's a longer trip. And so they wanted something to, to relax yourself. So they would take a nibble of the cookie and just sit back on the airplane, basically pass out for six, seven hours while they, they made the trip across Atlantic, across uh, Australia. Well, that cookie kept getting smaller and smaller. They just started blaming Fuji for, for double dipping on them, you know? And <laughs> get, I mean, it was a big, big deal, big argument. Hey, you're doing Okay, well, what can we do with the cookie? Who can we trust with a cookie? So I believe it was Kerr to come up. Let's give it to the college boy over there. He don't do anything. Yeah. Okay. So they gave it to me. So here we go. Now I'm 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 the keeper of the cookie. And I'm making sure that they know each and they made me promise, okay, Briscoe, they all three of them together. Now you can't give one of us a piece unless you give all three of us a piece. No matter what we say or how we try to bribe you, you cannot you cannot give it up. Do we have your word on that? So I had to give my word on it. I probably even had to sign a document that I wouldn't. <laughs> and no matter what what they did or how much they were offering me to to pay me for a piece of their own cookie, I would I wouldn't give it to them unless the other guys were present. And so. Keeper of the cookie. I was proud of that, that role. I mean, I was a rookie and here these veterans, you know, sold out Madison square garden, never made their rent in the world, trusted me with their, their stash, you know? So, um, anyway, bottom line is I met this young lady, she's a flight attendant. And, uh, and so she liked, she liked to partake and, 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 and this stuff. So she talked me into, biting into the cooking. I told her the whole story. I'm not supposed to give this stuff. Well, they won't know. We'll just take a little pinch of it and try it as your first time, you know, try it. So I took a little pinch of it and, you know, I went to magic land. You, you, you kissed <laughs> so, the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so pretty soon, you know, the, the guy, they're starting to brisk of words of cooking. I pulled a cookie, man, that, that thing's smaller than it was. I said, I, I, I'm sorry, but don't you remember the other night in Melbourne, you, you said you had to have one, you had the okay of, of the other two guys. And so, you know, I gave you a chunk of, it. yeah, but don't tell them. And then another guy would come, man, that's smaller than it usually is. <laughs> so pretty soon that's cookie disappeared, you know, and they were, what the hell happened to her cookie? And so then they discovered, you know, I was ratted out by the young lady. You know? oh, for God's sake, after all that. <laughs> so needless to say, I lost I lost control of the cookie after that. <laughs> well, there's no no cookie left to lose control over. So you, no you, crumbs either, no crumbs. <laughs> no crumbs. That's the spirit. Uh, I'll give you one more. Uh, the most memorable backstage fight you ever saw. Wow. Most memorable. I have to tell you a funny one. It probably wasn't the most violent or most uh, most uh, physical one I saw, but one I'm one I'm I was standing right next to my brother Jack. We were in I know exactly where it is, Savannah, Georgia. And Steve Kern and I we're doing I think we're doing a six man match with Jack, myself, and Steve Kern. We're doing a six man match. We're back in the back, and you know, back in those days, security isn't what it was, is today, you know. And uh, I guess uh, if you take away Roman Reigns, it just don't happen too many times to where, where a guy gets attacked. But back in those days, it was a common deal. So all of a sudden, this this uh, this Savannah George redneck gets gets backstage, and he's right there by the curtain, and he comes up and he starts talking. Well, a guy backstage, you figure if he's backstage, he's got a reason to be back there. And we didn't know that he had just snuck in. We, you know, you see crew back there doing their, their jobs all day long. So you don't really think a lot about it. This guy comes right out of all people. He comes up to my brother, NCAA wrestling champion, world heavyweight champion, one of the toughest men that ever lace up a, uh, a pair of boots. 
and he starts this. Rassin's all fake. Rassin's all phony. Rassin's all this. Jack said, but I don't know who you are, but get out of my face and get out of here. You don't belong back here. Rassin, he punched Jack one more time. Jack just reared back, and he and Jack was left-handed, so I don't think a guy was expecting a left-handed punch, but Jack caught him right, right here on the chin, and you just saw that chin go one direction, and the body goes straight down. <laughs> and Steve Kern, funny as Steve Kern, he looked over my brother Jack. I dang Jack, I was expecting to see something here. Damn NCAA undefeated uh, wrestling champion, you know, world wrestling champion. I don't even see a farmer's carry. All I saw was a left damn hook. <laughs> <laughs> You're what was so damn tough about you? <laughs> you know? So when all when all when it all comes said and done, you know, it wasn't a farmer's carry that took a guy out or was it a left hand roundhouse and dropped the guy right to his back, you know. <laughs> Nice to know that he was uh, he was multifaceted. He could he could kick your ass in any number of ways. Yeah, a lot <laughs> of guys were like that back in those days. You just didn't want to mess around with mm. those guys. You didn't know what what they were doing. They were... I'm uh, I'm going to ask you a few random things from back and forth in the career now. So it'll just be what uh, what I can glean from the script because I I wrote like a 48 hour you know worth of questions. So uh... script, buddy, I got my I have a script. The only script I like Michael A's the only script we used to get back in our days. You take to the pharmacy, you know. <laughs> oh no, I'll show I'll show you mine. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, I don't <laughs> no have one. No pharmacy. No, no pharmacy will uh, <laughs> trade me for anything for these things. <laughs> uh, can you tell me? And I know this is the question you've probably been asked more than anything else. But can you explain to me why? Uh, you decided to buy into the Georgia Territory, but then you didn't really work the Georgia ter- Territory that much. You were more based in mid-Atlantic. Um, I bought it to the, uh, my share of the Georgia Championship for investment opportunity. And business was great, and you know, I, from the school, you know, I uh, fortunately I was I was educated, and and I knew that my body wasn't I wasn't a big giant guy, and I wasn't destined to be world heavyweight champion. I was, was going to be a, a good good position where I could make a decent living. But I also realized that that brother, you know, the body will only last so many bumps. You know, you got that like a dance card. You know, you only got so many slots for dancers. So you want to make sure when you get down that bottom, you, you save the the last stand for of the proper one. So I I'd always knew that there'd come a time and day where I'd have to have something to fall back on. And uh, my brother and I were, were, were very fortunate because we were so close. So we invested, we invested in real estate. We had two or three businesses going here in Tampa and in Georgia, we invested in real estate, but the opportunity came up where there was some shares available in Georgia. And I, and I, like I said, I always had outside investment. I would, I was always taught to save my money. It's not what you make, it's how much you save. And so I tried to make it saving more than what was coming in. So I had cash. And so the guy needed money, he needed cash. So I was approached Briscoe, you know, I wasn't the first one approached him and my brother was already a shareholder in there and they, you know, and we were with the times that we did uh, that I did go in and work Georgia, you know, we busted it open and grew some money and made some money out of that that place. So promoters were like, if you got a good guy, a good business guy, or somebody seems like a good, good head on the show, bring him into the business. So I was, I started buying my little shares of Jordan and I ended up buying shares of Florida, but that's basically how it began as I knew I couldn't last forever. So I wanted to stake and, 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 and just to make this story a little bit longer back when I first started in the business, I, uh, Jack was already in the business, my brother, Jack. So I would, I would, I'd, I was lucky where I, I was at Oklahoma State University on scholarship, but during the summertime and spring breaks, I would call Leroy McGurk, who was a promoter, and I'd drive the ring truck. So I would, I would, I would not only drive the ring truck, but they got to trust me where I'd set up the, the chairs and I'd work the box office and I'd do the, I'd do the settlement at the box office. I did the whole thing. So I started, you know, okay. 25% or 30% goes over here to talent. The 70% goes back over here to the promoter. So as I'm counting out that money, my little simple mind said, you know, here's $1 here and here's $7 over here. 
which side do I want to be on when I, when I get there? So I had that experience at an early age on which side to be on. So it wasn't very difficult when the opportunity and those opportunities didn't come up every day for some wrestler to purchase part of a territory. You had to go through a certain vetting process. So, so I jumped at the opportunity and, and then after people found out I had a little cash, more opportunities started to come along. So it was, it was just, I was lucky. I actually, the first, first one that I bought was, uh, Buddy Coates, uh, his stock in Georgia and Buddy had just gone through that, that horrific airplane crash and he wasn't able to work and all that stuff. So he offered me a price and I didn't try to cut him down on his price cause I knew he needed the money. And I went with his, 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 his original costs and what's that, that original cost cost me more than all the other stock combined, I think, because I didn't want to screw buddy because he was needing medical assistance and that was the only way to get it. So I, I bought buddy stock from Georgia. That's how I ended up as being a stockholder there. Uh, what, um, what month, what year was this when you bought oh, the stock? Whenever the plane crash was, you'll have to yeah. go home. Okay. Um, yeah. So other people, uh, so we've got Paul Jones and Jim Barnett and uh, you and Jack all sell your shares to Vince McMahon, Black Saturday. It's a, a very complicated Green, story. Green people Saturday. Can... Green and... Saturday. Green... Oh, well, Green Saturday for you, of course. <laughs> well, actually, that brings me to the question, actually, is... Did you decide to sell because you were disgruntled working with Oli, or did you decide to sell because you were going to make a good profit on your investment? It wasn't a, uh, that great question. We, we decided to sell because my brother and I, like I said, we were fortunate where we attended college, but you know, you, you got any business at all, expansion is a key to, to growth and making money. But the, the fraternity of the NWA at that time did not allow you to expand too much. And now, now we got a brand new vehicle enters the uh, the race in professional wrestling, and that vehicle is called cable television. You cannot control where cable television goes. So all those agreements that the NWA uh, owners had were Florida wouldn't go into this territory or Georgia wouldn't go into the mid Atlantic or mid Atlantic wouldn't go into there. All those with your TVs, because people, people didn't want your TV t- you know, you know, like anywhere else, a, a group start, a new group start. Everybody wants to see what they're bringing to the table. And, uh, an old group. Well, okay. Here comes it. What are they carrying? You know? So, Everybody wants to see them in the beginning, you know, until things settle down. So promoters across the country were scared to death of this cable TV. Well, Jack and I realized that, hey, you know, we did, we made one ex- uh, expansion, Georgia did. We went into Ohio, Michigan, and West Virginia. That place was burnt to the ground by the old original sheik that, pr- that promoted it. And I was a promoter who went in there and tried to, square things off. And that was the roughest job. I think I had was trying to get, I walk into a TV station. We'd like our, our, our TV promotion done there. Well, you, you work with that iron sheik. He owes us $50,000. You go over to radio station. Same thing. Would you run a promotion? Well, you know, the last rising promoter. So I, we had to start paying everything up front all for to promote the city. So, well, what, what, what happened is finally, uh, Finally, it got to the deal where we'd, we were we were knocking out. We went into the sheet because it was a burnout territory. Nobody was promoting it. So our TV at TBS at the time, they give you what these these rating sheets and the damn book was like this. So you go through, you go through, you know, 5 million subscribers in X, X town, whatever it was. Man, we should run there. Well, we go to Barnett. Well, we can't run there because Fritch is running there or Vern's running there or one of the other NWA. So the expansion, even though we had this wonderful vehicle that nobody knew anything about, we couldn't use it. Well, Vince setting up in there in that damn New York, he knew what was going on. And, and our partners, we, we tried to convince our partners expansion is the only way we're going we're gonna to beat this guy. Now, we can't do it because of our relationship with the NWA. We, we did our due diligence with everybody. And the thing that, that kind of gets lost in the shuffle is Vince wasn't the first guy we went to about selling our, our territory. Really? 
Jim Crockett was the first guy we went to. Then Jim Crockett's partner, the Marnix that ran Virginia for, for him. Eddie Graham, we went to several different, Bill Watts, we went to several different people, and all of them would call Ole. And Ole would say, they're trying to screw you. They're asking too much money for it. They'll never get that kind of money. They're just disgruntled. They're, they're pissed off at me, and, uh, and uh, they're just trying to get even with me. You know, it, it's not worth what they're asking for. So one day, just as luck would have, Piper had left, gone to work for Vince. He had work in Madison Square Garden. A table, he went to grab a table. And the table had, uh, on the inside of it, where you grab it, that edge had been shaved down, so it was kind of rough. So when he grabbed it, all of his, all of his tendons on his fingers got, got, got severed. So we went, we, we'd heard what Piper might lose his fingers. Well, Piper was a great friend of my brother and I. So we want to know how Roddy was. We're doing TV in Jim Crockett's office. And uh, Jack walks in. Hey, uh, Jimmy, did you hear about Piper? Yeah. Well, how's he doing? Well, I don't know. And Jim, uh, Jack said, why don't you call Vince and find out, you know, if Piper's all right. Well, I'm not calling that SOB, you know. And Crockett said, well, if you want to call him, Jack, you call him. So Jack picks up the phone, calls Vince, and... Boom, Ben picks up the phone right away. Jack tells him he's in Jimmy Crockett's office doing bit, uh, promos, uh, uh, interview promos for the for next week. And he said, well, I know you can't talk to him, but you, can you say yes or no? And you guys be interested in sitting down and talking to, to me. And Jack said, yes. He said, well, call me as soon as you guys get in a place where you can do it. Well, of course, we're not thinking that he's wanting uh, wanting to buy our stock out. We're thinking he's wanting us to, because we're hot. We just turned heel against Steamboat and Youngblood and we're selling out all over the place. We're figuring that he wanted it as a talent, and neither one of us wanted to go and work that schedule. So we called him. We finished the interviews. We went to Jack's apartment. Jack picked up a phone call to Vince. Vince said, hey, uh, I understand you guys are shopping, shopping your, your, your shares of Georgia championship price injected. Yeah. He said, would you like to talk to me about it? And, uh, Jack says, yeah. And he said, well, when can you guys come to New York? So we looked on our books and noticed we had a Thursday off coming up the next week. Well, we got the next Thursday off. We're in Virginia already. So we can, you know, it's a short, short flight to, to New York city, then back to back to Virginia. So we can do it next Thursday. So, Vince set up the whole thing and we were, we didn't tell a damn soul and we were able to go up New York to LaGuardia airport and met in one of the Eastern airlines, uh, conference rooms and, and kind of hammered out an agreement to, to move forward and then to keep it between ourselves and how we kept it a secret for five months. I'll never know, but, uh, it was probably the best kept secret ever in the business up to that point. Yeah. It sounds like it. I mean, just telephone, tell a friend, tell a wrestler is a yeah. saying I hear quite a lot. So that's uh, that does surprise me. Uh, before uh, before I let you go, or it depends how much time you've got, but I will have to ask you one more thing. You go to the WWF with your brother Jack. You do the tag team thing. You're against Trevor Mur- uh, Trevor Murdoch, Dick Murdoch, <laughs> and his his son almost, <laughs> Dick Murdoch and Adrian Adonis. Excuse me. And then one day, uh, as far as I understand, uh, Jack goes, "I've had enough of this. See you later." What? And- and Don Morocco had a big part of that too. Did he really? Well, you've <laughs> yeah. got to tell me that, surely. A big part of that. And Don don't tell everything, but I know a lot about Don now. <laughs> and so anyway, yeah, yeah, that story is exactly true. Uh, Jack, I mean, Jack was, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous now, but Jack had just turned 40, what he thought was old, you know, at that time. And we're going back, what? 30, 30 years ago, 40 was, you know, kind of 30 was the deal where, you know, the, the old saying here in the States, you can't trust anybody over 30. Well, now Jack had turned 40, you know, he, he felt that he was losing a step. And Jack was one of these guys that would had so much pride in his work and how he moved and how he looked and all that stuff that he wouldn't settle for anything less than being, being perfect every night. And that those schedules, I'm sure you've heard, they were insane. They were absolutely incredible. Hundred days in a row, eighty days in a row. Jack, we just come off of of, of that uh, that that angle where Ricky and Jay were we were healed, and we really had to bust our ass. And all of a sudden, 
we're we're completely different. We're back to being baby faces working with uh, uh, Adrian and and Dicky and having a ball doing what two better guys. But Jack had just had we just just been on one of those years where like we were like in New York on uh, Madison Square Garden, Wilson on this day, L.A. on this day, Utah on this day, then all the way back to to Newark. On on the on the on the next day, so we're in. The, we get finally make the loop. We're back to Newark. We're supposed to be Morocco. Morocco is living there, right? He's living in Jersey, so he's gonna pick us up at the at the Newark airport and and ride us down to uh, to Philly. We're always we're always buddies. Were we, we worked like that? So Don had got there early, parked his car, and of course the plane was delayed because of the storm. So. We finally get off the airplane. We're we're walking down and we pass a bar in Morocco. Hey, let's go have a drink. Let's go have a Bloody Mary or something. <clears throat> and so that Bloody Mary turned into two Bloody Marys, turned into three Bloody Marys, turned into a dozen or so Bloody Marys. So now we're walking out of the damn airport. We're two Florida boys. We don't, we're not going to buy no heavy coke. Why? Because that means you want to live up in that area. So we're still in those lightweight jackets, you know, that, that, that you have down there in Florida. So we step outside in where that parking lot is supposed to be. And all you see is a white field with, a, with some humps covered where cars are at. <laughs> now, Morocco been there three hours and we could not find this car. So we go back near the airport and all of a sudden we hear this airplane ahead and, and it's easy to know the direction because most airplanes are headed south. It's Gerald, you see that airplane headed south? I said, I sure do. He said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be on the next one. But Jack, we got to go to Philly. You go to Philly. I'm going to be on that next damn airplane. He turned around, walks in the damn uh, airport, buys him a ticket and me and Morocco standing there looking at each other like what's going on. Jack turned around and go, gets on a plane. He's headed to back to Florida. He's headed south. All right, well, I might as well go. I'm here. So I get in the car, me and Don, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to tell them. The bosses, once I get to Philly, you know, what happened to my brother? Get down there. Where's your brother? He went home. Why did he go home? He says, too cold. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, uh, he's too cold. He, he, he had enough. He went, but he quit and he never come back. That was just as simple as that. But Don Morocco was the one. Hey, let's go ahead and play there. <laughs> so it's your fault, Morocco. Jack walked out on. <laughs> I, I'm so going to blame Don when I see him next as well. I'll tell him that one as well. Did you realize that, in effect, that was basically the retirement of both of you uh, from from wrestling? Or were you always in your mind planning to go somewhere else and somewhere else? Or were you just, at that point, no, I'm done? Oh, what the deal? WrestleMania 1 was coming up. And, uh, and Mike Rotundo, Mike and, and Barry Wyndham were, what were the USA Express or whatever they were. They were feuding with the Sheik and, uh, and uh, Volkov. And so George Scott was doing the booking and George, George was a big fan of us. We got George, the book with Vince when Vince bought us out of Georgia. We recommended George to be the booker there. So George had just seen that, that, that angle that we had done with Ricky and Jay, and he wanted to duplicate it, copy it with us going and get Barry and Mike. And like I said, Jack had just turned, it was in a 40, 41 years old, whatever he was at the time. He said, I can go through another one of those things because, you know, working with Ricky and Jay, I mean, they were 20 years younger than us and, you know, they could go and Barry and Mike were even younger than that. And they could go and they were bigger and they could go. Jack just did not want to, we were, you know, George said, you know, we will turn you guys and, uh, well, you know, you guys will beat Murdoch and Don get the titles and they'll drop them to Ricky and Jay. And then we'll go all over the world with, with Briscoe's and not Ricky and Jay, but with uh, uh, Mike and uh, Barry. Jack, no, I, I'm not going to put myself through that again because he didn't feel like he could be live up to being Jack Briscoe. So that was really the main thing. He didn't want to get into another where a commitment where he knew and he, we'd been there long enough to see the schedule and know these guys are working 80 to 100 days in a row and, and Jack had done the same thing, invested his money and saved his money. And he walked out and he never went back to a wrestling match. 
Oh. And uh, uh, so, how come you didn't start doing? You know, carry on doing singles wrestling matches. Were you just done as well then? I, you know, I, I, I Vance told me I could stay as long as I wanted to, but I came home, of course, you know, and let let things kind of die down, and that angle kind of disappear out, 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 out in space there. And so I, I you know, I'm wondering what I'm going to do, and uh, I got a phone call. I'm I, basically I, I, I. I took like six to eight months off and just did the body shop and just did the real estate and stuff like that. Just, just did business and was enjoying my life and remodeled my house. And uh, like I said, we just made that big sale to Van. So, uh, you know, I wanted to be around while the remodeling. And then my first son, Wes was just born. I'd been just, uh, maybe a year old. So I wanted to kind of spend some time with him. I didn't really want to commit myself to that schedule. And, uh, and I've been a tag team for the last five years, and I, I didn't want to go back to the single deal because, like I said, working for Vance, I wasn't no gigantic guy, and I knew I wasn't I'd, unless he was going to team me up with the guy that was going to be on top. You know, I was going to be destined to be that middle guy there, and I didn't want that. I didn't want that that position, and so I called Vance. I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to come back as a wrestler. So I was another three or four weeks and I got a call from Vince that, Hey, bud, I'm getting ready to open up the South. He said, I'm having trouble getting into a lot of building debt. I need somebody that that familiar with the South and familiar with the building managers. And I know through Jim Barnett that you were friends with, with all the building managers. And, uh, and I was, you know, I'd always, cause I was on the business side of it too. I'd always want to meet the, uh, the TV people, and the, and, the, and the building people, those were the two most important uh, contacts you could have in, in the business with being friendly, number one, with your TV people. So you keep your TV on there and then they being friends with, with the building people. So you could always get your prime date in the building. So I'd had that business since where I'd made friends with them. I said, sure. I know a lot of building managers. So I was able to open the doors and get into the South where Vince wasn't able to get into on his own. So I became what they called the local promoter at the time. I did that for about five or six years. All my towns were selling out. But the funny thing about it, a lot of the agents would come down here to Florida or Georgia or Carolinas or Alabama. And Bristol, you've been here forever. You know, this is what we want in the main event. You figure it out. So I, I would started doing the, the finishes for the agents coming in and the boys like that because I was still young and I was still considered one of the boys instead of office. And so, uh, the next thing I know, Vince is getting ready to go into a steroid trial and he's wanting to line up a group of guys just in case he's found guilty that he can just kind of throw in and, and they just kind of you know, seamlessly, uh, yeah, run, run like the Jerry Jarrett as well. He was invited. Yeah, wasn't he? yeah, yeah. exactly. The Jarrett, he put together a group of people like that, you know, with had experience promotion and everything. And I was one of those guys. And fortunately that never happened, you know, but, uh, I just didn't want to get back, go back to, uh, to wrestling, you know, uh, before I made my move to Carolina, I, 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 I when I did started to, I, I, I kind of felt, you know, myself, you know, kind of limited on, cause I didn't want to move far away. Cause like I said, I had my ground businesses here in Florida. My son was born and I didn't really want to start packing up and moving, moving around the country. So the, the wrestling part of it, unless I could find something in the office, I wasn't, so I, I got that offer to make that expansion into Michigan and Ohio, but that was like, we'd only go every other week. So the rest of the time I was home. So. It was just one of those deals where I'd made up my mind, you know, uh, uh, hey, you know, I had a hell of a run and I ran fast as I could run, you know, but I can't run no more. So, uh, you know, and you I, made uh, money and you made money and you invested well and so, uh, you know, financially solvent and you could had options, basically, it sounds like. Exactly. And so I, I, that was, I called it, I called it career and, uh, you know, I didn't do anything else physically until the Stooges came on. <laughs> what a time it was. I've got so many more questions to ask. I, I realize we've gone a bit over. If you want me to ask, or if you'd like me, or if you would let me ask more questions, I'm more than happy to carry on. If you want me to wrap up, you tell me. 
Well, let's do one more good one, and then we'll wrap it up. Oh. And then you can always have an episode two. Yeah, you know? I'll have to. I'll have to save up and do another episode two with you, definitely. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna look through. I'm gonna look through my script, and I'm gonna find out the best one I can possibly find. So I'll, I'll give you the ones the, I'm not the gonna. The green ones. The, the green ones. The green ones. <laughs> okay, there you go. So yeah, you I've got, got all the green ones as well. Okay, um, somebody the asked. Green Angle, minis, the green minis of Morocco and gone. Well, I'll tell you what then. I, the one I always have to ask because I ask everybody their opinion Jim Cornette or Vince Russo? And working under both. Or with both, I should say. You know, I, I, I don't have an issue. I love Jim Cornette because there's only one Jim Cornette. I mean, I wish everybody in the wrestling business was like Jim Cornette. I really do. I, you know, I, would it be a better, better, better business i probably not but but would it be more fun to be in Uh, definitely yes jimmy has got the greatest sense of humor and the greatest uh greatest uh i've drugged jimmy out of production meetings with high 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 level wwe officials so many times like i can't count the time and the countries that I've had to drag him out of the meetings because he was coming over the table <laughs> after one of the, the higher was shots. That, was that Kevin Dunn by any chance? Uh, I'm not naming names, but I took the <laughs> guy with the initials KD, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I grabbed him on one shoulder and Bruce to grab him on the other shoulder and we'd walk him to the elevator and punch his floor that made sure he got on the elevator and went to the right floor, you know. And so, uh, corny, corny, I love him to death. Um, I mean, uh, you know, we got to all evolve, and, and I'm glad that Jim Cornette hadn't evolved because we need one guy in the business like a Jim Cornette. I love him to death. I love listening. I laugh. I laugh. And sometimes, I, you know, he makes a lot of sense if you, if you read between his lines there. But what a historian, what a collection of history that he has, you know. I got nothing but big time respect for Jim Cornette. Vince Russo, I never had any really major issues from Russo. Russo was kind of afraid of me. And I don't want to say that in a cocky manner, but he always treated me with the utmost respect. And uh, did I like everything he did? No. Do I like everything they do now? No. But I don't like some of the things uh, that uh, Russo did. Yeah. Do I think he was the reason why the business went, went, went south? No, I don't. I think it was a plethora of things. And uh, I've got a lot of respect for, for Russo. Would I go out drinking with either one of them? No, they're not my type <laughs> of guys that I go out with. They're, give me a Piper. Give me a Morocco. Give me, give me a, a Black Jack Land. Uh, give me somebody like that where I can go out and laugh and have fun. I like to get away from the business every once in a while. And those guys, I like to get away from the business also and enjoy themselves. So, but do we need them around? I mean, hell, we were, we're all entertained by what they have to say. So keep on saying it, you know, keep on stirring it. I mean, the business is meant to be stirred. With, um, with Vince Roos, I can't imagine that in 1998, you end up being one of the major characters uh, through to 99 so, with Jim Cornette at the helm. So Vince Russo saw you and thought, you know what, you would be great on TV still. And you were. You and Pat Passon were such a great duo, you know, and and uh, what did the third uh, the third highest rating in Raw history, I believe, as well. I always heard it with the, I, I could go with the highest rated, where the highest <laughs> rated wrestling segment in raw history. Let's put it that way. Uh, can you imagine what they would get nowadays? A uh, kind of bonus if they would draw half of what we drew in that one segment. I mean, they would, they'd close down damn Titan Towers and have a damn, have a damn New Year's Eve party in the middle of July. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very lucky to come along at the same, at the same time. And, uh, they saw some Pat and I, the re- reason that character worked so well was because Pat and I didn't take ourselves serious and we, we were able to laugh about ourselves. I mean, we, we realized what, what our legacy was and our legacy didn't change uh, because of we're playing two goofballs. I think it enhanced our legacy because it showed another sign. It showed a diverse ability to, to our talent that we were able to do. 
it was the most one of the most enjoyable time I ever had in the business with teaming up with Pat Patterson and 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 getting just uh, even in our role, there was so much psychology that went into playing that role. You didn't want to overdo the character so much where it was, you know, just a real hokey ass kissing type deal. You wanted to have a little, you know, and we we always, you know, we always, you know, when we were to ourselves, we were always macho guys, you know, but around Vince, it was yes sir, no sir. But the funny thing about it, Vince Russo, and I got to give him give, give give him due here. We were called, we were known as the associate when we first started doing this because nobody wanted to call us stooges. You know, because we weren't stooges, number one, we were associates. So finally one day in a production meeting, the, the word just happened to slip out, stooge. And Vince kind of stopped the meeting. He said, wait a minute, they're not stooges, they're our associates. And Rizzo had the balls to stand up and I set up and say, Hey, you guys got any problem being called stooges? Well, man, Pat thought it was hilarious. No, call us. We call us anything you want to. Just write our names right on the paycheck. <laughs> we become the stooges there. But they, in the beginning, they had so much respect for Pat and I. It was Vince McMahon's associates, you know. And then we became the stooges. And when we become the stooges, of course, everybody adopted that name. And it was really funny backstage because the talent didn't want to call us stooges because we had dealt with all the talent and they knew that we wouldn't, we, we, we weren't Vince's the stooges. They knew we were side by side co-workers. You know? <laughs> well, I was actually going to mention, so, so you weren't offended by stooges, even the first time I was like, oh, how dare you? And then, but the thing is no one at home would have realized the connotations with that. Cause you'd think probably the three stooges as a fan. Well, Sard was originally the third stooge, Sard the Slaughter, but oh, Sard, yeah. Sard was so valuable as a talent. You know, if you remember back in those days that when something, when they needed something, Sard was kind of the enforcer where he would go in the ring, you know, you had to get by Sard and Slaughter, you know, so, so Sard was needed in that role bigger than, and he's, he still gets upset about it. I've been in the dress room with him recently a couple times. He's man, I, you know. But and I said, Sarge, you're just too damn valuable to the company with, with the other roads. And me and Pat were past our prime to get in the ring where you still could get in the ring. I mean, little did we know we were going to have to get that physical stone cold and I have to beat the crap out of him. <laughs> or maybe it was the other way around. <laughs> It was so long ago. No one will remember. You can just say you beat the crap out of Steve it Austin. Yeah, it was a ball. And I, I respect Vince uh, Russo for did, uh, for not wanting to call us as students in the beginning. But when he slipped out and said the student in the production meeting and it just kind of stuck and we were asked at that time if we minded being called that. No, we don't mind. I mean, it's just a role. I mean, we're, we're all here to have fun. So. That's exactly. kind of how they, how they evolved into associate to a student. Well, we, uh, well, uh, hopefully you've had fun. I've had fun. Hopefully everybody watching has had fun. Um, I'm going to close the podcast down. We've gone a bit over what we said we would, but uh, thank you so much, Gerald, for joining us. I'll, I'll tell you a couple, couple of questions I didn't get to ask you. Uh, stories about Greg Valentine, Andre the Giant, Paul Bearer, um, the Mark Henry giving, uh, May Young giving birth to him. All those things for a, maybe another time. Uh, say maybe another time. Definitely for another time. If you're up for a part two later down the road. I'm ready for uh, episode two, brother. <laughs> very good, very good. Right, I'll do the closing then. I'll look at the right camera. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Gerald, for entertaining us. And we'll uh, hopefully do a part two sometime in the future. Thank you. And so long to my friends over in the UK, brother.